I would like to thank Max Delaney and the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art for inviting me to be a part of this lecture series, Defining Moments. From the early 1980s to the mid 1990s, it was hard to open a newspaper anywhere in the Western world, listen to a radio broadcast or turn on a television set without encountering some discussion of the new disease, AIDS, and its causative factor, the HIV virus. In the same fashion, HIV AIDS came under scrutiny in many forms of cultural response, from theatre and dance to fiction, poetry, music and soap opera, such that the public often now found its entertainment engaged in serious debate around issues of illness, prejudice, medical research and death. In 1981, cases of a rare lung infection called Pneumocystis carini pneumonia, or PCP, were found in five young, previously healthy gay men in Los Angeles. At the same time, there were reports of a group of men in New York and California with an unusually aggressive skin cancer named Kaposi sarcoma, or KS. In December 1981, the first cases of PCP were reported in people who inject drugs. In June 1982, a group of cases among gay men in Southern California suggested that the cause of the immune deficiency was sexual and the syndrome was initially called gay-related immune deficiency, or GRID. Even though the New York Times used the less loaded name for the disease, AIDS, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, as early as August 1982, the damage was already done. As conservative politicians, moral commentators and religious organisations increasingly used this new health crisis to justify their hatred of sexual and other minorities, such as drug users. In January 1983, it was discovered that AIDS could also be transmitted through heterosexual sex. Later that year, AIDS was subsequently found to be caused by a human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, which originated in non-human primates in Central and West Africa and was spread primarily through contact with bodily fluids, meaning that haemophiliacs and patients receiving blood transfusions were also susceptible to contracting their HIV virus through contaminated blood products. The new disease spread quickly, enabled by international air travel. Whereas more than 3,500 people in the USA had died from AIDS-related complications by the end of 1984, by 1986, some 85 separate countries reported close to 40,000 cases of AIDS. By 1990, between 8 and 10 million people worldwide were estimated to be living with HIV. Sadly, until late 1995, there were few effective treatments for the disease, and as AIDS spread, so did the paranoia and phobia associated with it. Many people were mistakenly frightened that HIV could be transmitted just by touch or by close proximity. As a young gay curator working at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra, Australian Capital Territory, in the early 90s, I was not immune to either the spread of the disease or the AIDS phobia and homophobia associated with it. Homosexuality had only recently been decriminalised in Victoria in 1981 and in New South Wales in 1984, and many people still felt threatened by this. In the winter of 1991, more than a dozen gay bashings occurred in Canberra, and the city's only gay bar was vandalised and sprayed with graffiti reading, Die of AIDS, fuckers. While not impacted on the same scale as the United States, the effect of HIV AIDS upon Australia in the late 1980s and early 1990s was equally devastating to all those affected by the disease. At 31 December 1993, Australia had recorded more than 17,000 cases of HIV infection and more than 3,000 deaths from AIDS-related complications. Where the cause of transmission was identifiable, 83.6% of cases involved male-to-male -male sexual contact, including 5.7% involving male-to-male -male sex and recreational intravenous drug use. Given these statistics, it is not surprising that in these years, the strongest response to the impact of HIV AIDS in Australia came from artists who identified as gay and lesbian. This was a very brave thing to do at a time when homophobia was still very much prevalent in Australia. In 1992, I became fascinated with artistic responses to the AIDS crisis worldwide, inspired by Douglas Crimp's landmark book, AIDS Demographics, which documented the visual art associated with AIDS protest activism in the USA. 
1993, working with Nancy Siever, director of the Drill Hall Gallery at the Australian National University, I organised a small exhibition of Australian AIDS educative posters called Fighting Back, the Art of AIDS Education. In 1993 as well, the Humanities Research Centre at the Australian National University, headed by Professor Graham Clark, organised a year-long Sexualities and Culture series of conferences and brought to Canberra leading American AIDS commentators Thomas Sokolovsky, Carol Vance, David Halperin and Gail Rubin. Meeting them was inspirational, as were conversations I had with Jill Matthews and John Ballard at the ANU. Together we discussed the rise of a new visual culture that was emerging globally in the face of the AIDS pandemic. Tom Sokolovsky had staged some of the world's most important exhibition on the topic of AIDS at that time at New York University's Grey Art Gallery, and he encouraged me to think about a major exhibition that would include Australian responses to the social impact of the disease. From all of this came the impetus to propose to Betty Churcher, Director of the National Gallery of Australia, the staging of a major exhibition focused upon artistic responses to the AIDS pandemic and the moral panic it had engendered throughout the world. At the time, Betty and the NGA's Head of International Art, Michael Lloyd, were wanting to stage exhibitions that mirrored the collision of contemporary art with the fabric of life at the close of the 20th century. I argued that the time was right for an exhibition that reflected the relentless onslaught of HIV AIDS on the personal, social, moral and political fabric of Western societies. Betty Churcher and Michael Lloyd enthusiastically agreed with my proposal and supported the project in every way, and I pay tribute to their courage for doing so at this difficult time. This was not the first exhibition on the subject of HIV AIDS to be held in Australia. Among its predecessors, both Imaging AIDS, organised by the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art and Linden Gallery in Melbourne in 1989, and Plus Positive, Artists Addressing AIDS at the Campbelltown City Art Gallery in New South Wales in early 1994, helped shape my view of Australian artists' responses to AIDS. Aiming to show how HIV AIDS and its attendant problems had infiltrated societies at every level, I proposed to the NGA an exhibition that displayed work in a wide spectrum of media, from painting, sculpture and photography, to installation, costume, community art projects, computer imaging and video. As the first exhibition on this subject to be held at a national gallery anywhere in the world, the stakes were high. Obviously, this was a show which needed to address the impact of HIV AIDS on many communities, and which was destined to be watched closely by those affected communities for the manner in which it represented them. Equally obviously, because this was an exhibition of contemporary art and not pure documentary, there were communities who were poorly represented or not represented at all. I was, for example, unable to find a single work of art addressing haemophilia and could find only one work discussing blood transfusion. Working before the arrival of the internet with a limited budget, limited travel opportunities and a short time frame, I was also confined to representing the impact of HIV AIDS on Western societies, the USA, England, France and Australia primarily, research travel to Asia and Africa not being possible at the time. Despite these limitations, I tried to talk about and to many different communities in Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS. The exhibition was deliberately orchestrated in both the selection of the works and in their installation to take visitors through a distinct emotional and instructional experience. Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS, held at the National Gallery of Australia, Canberra, between November 1994 and March 1995, presented over 200 works on the subject of HIV AIDS by more than 100 artists worldwide. The exhibition was generously sponsored by the National AIDS Campaign in recognition of the contribution played by the visual arts in overall AIDS education, community consciousness raising and specific AIDS awareness. Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS considered issues such as grief, loss and memorialization, political arts of the streets, the mapping of the body in the age of AIDS, sexual politics, stereotypes and prejudice, and art and censorship. It invited viewers to reflect on joy, love, fear, pain, strength, fallibility, hatred, heroism and hope. 
The exhibition's title, of course, referenced Thelma Houston's popular disco hit from 1977, which had been re-released in 1986 by the British pop duo The Communards, fronted by openly gay singer Jimmy Somerville and gay musician Richard Coles. It had inspired San Francisco-based artist Nalan Blake to create an elegiac design for bus shelter posters in the US in 1989 as part of the American Foundation for AIDS Researchers Educative Street Art Project On The Road. Both Amphar and Alan Blake gave permission for this compassionate and dignified image to be reutilised for the National Gallery of Australia's exhibition. And Alan's poster design was equally striking as it adorned the streets of capital cities in Australia to promote the new exhibition. Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS was divided into roughly five separate sections. The first room of the exhibition was designed to encourage visitors to shed their preconceptions or prejudgments about HIV AIDS and the people who were affected by it, reminding us that HIV AIDS does not discriminate, people do. Works such as Carl Tendatnik's silkscreen painting, AIDS Virus on White Blood Cell, Grey Virus Border, 1993, or Ronald Jones's sculpted untitled New Human Immunodeficiency Virus Particles Bursting from a Microvillus, 1988, reminded viewers that HIV AIDS is caused by a microscopic virus and not by someone's belonging to a particular race, class or lifestyle category. John Schlesinger's wall of backlit fingerprints of HIV positive Australians and Americans enlarged and emulsified onto transparent film, argued that people who are HIV positive are not other, but share a common humanity with the rest of the world. In order to counter the prevailing homophobia of the times and remind us that AIDS affected more than just the gay community, I placed in this opening gallery Kate Lose's 20 Million Whispers, 1992, which confronted this problem head on by announcing in loud pink neon lettering the presence of positive women in our society. Her use of this dramatic light sculpture aimed to spotlight the often hidden impact of AIDS on women. Also seeking to point out that the incidence of HIV AIDS worldwide was not restricted to the gay community were works such as Nalan Blake's Every 12 Minutes 1991, which reminded viewers very simply that in that year someone died of age-related complications somewhere in the world every 720 seconds. The gay body was imaged directly here, with Brenton Heath Carr's bodysuit Ken the Safe Sex Character 1992 a work commissioned by the Victorian AIDS Council and aimed at the clientele of Melbourne's gay party circuit. A life-size walking safe sex advertisement, the outfit was designed to be read in the context of a crowded, dimly lit dance floor, as it flashed its subliminal messages of responsible drug use and sexual safety. Derek Jarman's Blood, 1992, addressed the paranoia of the times about the transmission of HIV through bodily fluids. Here he repeated inflammatory headlines from the British tabloid press, reading AIDS blood in Marks and Spencer Pye's plot, and immersed them in a sea of red pigment inscribed with the virally loaded word blood. Nearby, New York artist Carrie Leibowitz's HIV positive panels inscribed the diagnosis of infection in actual blood on canvas. Also from New York, Angel Suarez Rosado's The Blue Bed, 1991, Image the volume of antiretroviral medication, in this case AZT or AZT to use the American, required to try to shore up the human body's immune system in the years before effective therapies finally came onto the market at the end of 1995. Juan de Villa's Love, 1988, subverted Robert Indiana's iconic pop PN to Free Love from 1967. De Villa's canvas recast the acronym AIDS acquired immune deficiency syndrome in its South American form, SIDA. The letters spelled out against an oozing, dripping composition that seemed to lament the death of love in a new era of infection. The second section or room of the exhibition focused on imaging the body and its relentless struggle in the age of AIDS. AIDS, by stripping people of their immune system, opened up the body to invasion on all fronts, making it a battleground for an ugly war of attrition as those affected struggle to fight off one opportunistic infection after another. The body as site of invasion, or as the defiant bat battleground in a war of morality versus sexuality, was central to much of the art that addressed AIDS in the late 1980s and early 1990s. 
At the centre of this gallery stood Sydney artist Arthur McIntyre's Monument to Intimacy, The Last Embrace, 1987, in which McIntyre laid a life-size skeletal drawing next to a beautifully crafted coffin in homage to the memory of art dealer Gary Anderson, who died of AIDS-related complications in 1991. Andrew Foster's untitled 1992 critiqued the way in which pre-AIDS gay culture to a large extent was defined by its imaging of men as one-dimensional sexual objects. His mirrored installation in which the viewer's face is reflected back between the painted representations of nine apparently healthy young men begged the question of how one's sexual antennae might react upon perceiving that these virile objects of desire are in fact infected. Foster here asked how a culture formerly built on youth and beauty must now regard itself in the wake of the devastation wrought by AIDS. The body was absent altogether in Nayland Blake's sculpture Workstation No. 2 Restraint, 1988, in which an empty steel operating table with dress, sword and leather neck collar attached spoke chillingly of the ethics of medical experimentation and the depersonalisation of hospital environments. The tone in this section of the exhibition was extremely sober, not to say bleak, in its frank presentation of images of bodily decay and suffering. Ross Teeth Smith's L'amour et la mort sont la même chose, Love and Death are the same thing, 1990-92, to offered the moving picture of intimacy between two men in a time of grief and physical decay. Smith's use of ripped and crushed photographic sections roughly adhered to their backing board with carpet tacks emphasised the fragility of bodies and souls torn asunder by the epidemic. Works by American artists such as Dwayne Michaels, The Father Prepares His Dead Son for Burial, 1991, and David Wojnarowicz's When I Put My Hands on Your Body, 1990, also brought home the physical pain of bodily loss. The work of Melbourne photographer Peter Lisiotis stemmed from a singular perspective, that of a heterosexual man reflecting on the position of gay men in the 1990s. In his photographic book, The Harmed Circle, Lysiotis focused upon the gay community, whom he perceived as having become new outsiders in modern society. The Harmed Circle narrated allegorically the fall from grace of a formerly charmed circle as it descended into a spiralling nexus of eros, love, and thanatos, death. Fragments of pure poetry, such as this page from the book, Billy says that a person's broken heart can sometimes smell of roses, blended with lyrical photomontage to evoke a hymn to the strength of love which transcends death and defeats its ironic power. Untitled Aids Pieta 1992 by David Edwards, also known as Sister Mary Daisy Chain, offered a gentle sense of humour, tinged with sadness and empathy for both the dead and the surviving bereaved. By its coy replacement of the Virgin Mary with Mother Inferior, leader of the gay male Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, and of the dead Christ with the svelte symbol of the post-AIDS universal gay body, Edward's Pieta acknowledged the role of his order in the fight against HIV AIDS, utilising the same irreverent humour the sisters brought to their espoused causes of gay liberation and AIDS prevention. The frank discussion needed to educate the populace in the fight against HIV AIDS brought to the foreground bodies that a conservative society would rather not see. Gay bodies, lesbian bodies, bisexual bodies, and drug-using bodies. To a great extent, these often marginalised groups rapidly became mainstreamed as debate about HIV-AIDS entered the public realm of the visual arts. Here, as in other sections of the exhibition, I hope to be able to achieve a delicate balancing act and solve a problem which had vexed me since I began working on the exhibition. That was how to avoid reinforcing the stereotype that only gay men were at risk from this disease, while at the same time acknowledging the fact that in 1994, gay men had borne the brunt of infection and suffering in Australian society. I thus tried to present wherever possible a mixed picture of the impact of the AIDS epidemic. I selected, for example, both a heterosexual and a homosexual couple from Jamie Dunbar's positive photographs which showed HIV-positive Australians in frank, warm sexual situations. Melbourne-based painter Ross Watson's gentle, reflective composition Untitled No. 1, 1993, offered the viewer an allegory of a woman testing positive for the HIV virus. Between old master quotations from Vermeer and Caravaggio, Watson pasted pages from a wall calendar covered with layers of delicate tissue paper. 
the passing calendar days still visible beneath their semi-opaque overlay, referred to the waiting period between testing and results, as well as signalling the woman's confrontation with the foreknowledge of limited time left to live after an HIV-positive diagnosis. Extra Medici's God Science 1994 Cibachrome photographs of post-tattoo blood swabs were an important contribution to the debate around the safety of cosmetic intrusions into the body, such as ear and body piercings, tattooing and minor surgery, given that HIV was transmitted through blood. One of Australia's most prominent tattoo artists, Extra Medici worked closely in Canberra with the AIDS Action Council, ACT, in developing safe tattooing procedures. After tattooing her clients, she took imprints of her work on ordinary kitchen towel paper, which left a trace of the actual tattoo in exuded blood. Her lush cibachromes captured the essence of the vulnerability of the human body and reminded viewers that humanity was no longer impregnable. Powerful works by Bronwyn Bancroft, Zane Saunders, H.J. Wedge and Manjula Manangua image the impact of HIV on Aboriginal communities. Manjula Manangua's bark painting, Untitled, The AIDS Story, 1993, offered a commentary on the dangers of unprotected sex and its role in the transmission of AIDS to the Aboriginal body, itself already suffering from a tragic history of prejudice, racism and neglect. Commissioned by the Department of Health and Community Services of the Northern Territory, Manangua's painting was used in AIDS education programs around that state. Bronwyn Bancroft's cheerful, life-affirming paintings focused on the positive values of love, caring, respect, dignity and acceptance. Turned into AIDS educative posters, Bancroft's AIDS awareness works crossed over into the mainstream spaces of everyday life in Australia at the time, appearing frequently in the background sets of Australian TV soap operas. The third section of the exhibition turned to visual representations of HIV AIDS in popular and especially gay culture and aimed to at once reinforce the tragic vision of the wake of HIV AIDS with the vastness of the memorial AIDS quilt and also to move people to laughter, whether by dazzling them with extraordinary Mardi Gras costumes or forcing them to laugh before Sydney artist David McDermott's wickedly funny rainbow text panels, spelling out black aphorisms such as, that's Miss Pufter to you, asshole, and it's my party and I'll die if I want to, sugar. Carrie Leibowitz, as he was his mother's favourite, 1987, injected acerbic New York Jewish humour here, drawing viewers in with his plethora of cuddly children's toys and then confronting their prejudices about adult sexual games. This section of the exhibition challenged some visitors' expectations of exactly what art was and what art was fit for display at a national gallery. A unique form of street theatre for most Australians in the early 1990s, the annual Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Parade offered the most cogent and controversial expression of queer visibility in this country. The parade inevitably meant many things, such as gay and lesbian pride, unity and strength, visibility, dispelling myths, and the fight against homophobia and anti-gay violence. The public televising of the 1994 procession down Oxford Street underscored for the general public the extent to which the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras Parade had become in one sense a forum for public mourning and a galvanising call to action in fighting the AIDS crisis. It was in this context that I installed at the centre of Don't Leave Me This Way prize-winning Mardi Gras costumes by Brian Ross, who died from AIDS-related complications just three weeks before the exhibition opened, and by Ron Muncaster. These were lovingly worked statements of survival triumphing over adversity and declarations of belief in the ultimate joy of life, even when surrounded by so many reminders of its impermanence and fragility. The end wall of this gallery was given over to the Names Quilt Project, which was founded by gay activists Cleve Jones and Mike Smith in San Francisco in 1987. The first Names Project fabric panels, each dedicated by their makers to a friend who had died from AIDS, were unveiled at the 1987 Lesbian and Gay Freedom Day Parade in San Francisco, where they were hung from the Mayor's balcony at City Hall. From these origins as a new expression of collective gay grief, the American Names Project grew to incorporate by 1994 more than 20,000 commemorative cloth panels, each six by three feet the size of a grave plot. What began as a focus primarily for the grief of the gay community, 
the quilt project soon crossed over beyond the borders of gay cultural expression to embrace the entire AIDS community. The quilt offered a centre for shared mourning and remembrance and was particularly useful in providing solace to non-gay AIDS-affected citizens who often had no other sense of belonging to a supportive community. The names quilt thus became a gift from the gay community to all of the disenfranchised AIDS bereaved, its purpose being as much to help the survivors of an AIDS death as to memorialise the deceased. The Australian Memorial AIDS Quilt Project was established in September 1988 by Andrew Carter and Richard Johnson in emulation of the American Names Project. For the exhibition, I borrowed a whole block of quilt panels made by and for Australian children at Camp Good Time, an initiative organised by the Paediatric AIDS Unit of the Prince of Wales Children's Hospital, Sydney, to provide support for children and their families living with HIV and AIDS. Other panels on display celebrated the lives of Australian conductor Stuart Challender and artist and former artistic director of the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, Peter Tully, who died of age-related complications in 1991 and 1992, respectively. Lastly, in this, the largest gallery in the exhibition, I wanted to represent street communities, the diverse activist organisations whose clever use of street graphics in the late 1980s and early 90s served at once to keep many social and financial issues around HIV AIDS before the general public and provided a constant visual reinforcement of their community's identity and existence. In the United States, there were many such groups. ACT UP, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, WHAM, the Women's Health Action Movement, Grand Fury and Gang. The best graphic street art produced in response to HIV AIDS emanated from the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, an activist lobby group which emerged in the face of the massive mismanagement of the AIDS crisis by both the United States government and the American health systems under Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Bush. From the outset, ACT UP benefited from the presence in its midst of a significant number of workers in the commercial design, advertising and film industries who knew full well how to shape activist imagery into a sexy and fashionable commodity. The repetition of these ACT UP graphics en masse was a galvanising force from 1987 to the mid-1990s in wave after wave of AIDS demonstrations demanding increased US funding for healthcare. Each demonstration carried its own graphic repeated across placards, banners, t-shirts, flyers, stickers and buttons. Designed to be short, memorable and immediately readable, these graphics were guaranteed to find their way into newspaper commentaries and television sound bites, projecting ACT UP's core message even from hostile or distorted media coverage. ACT UP's most memorable visual symbol remains what Douglas Crimp has aptly described as that simple graphic emblem, silence equals death printed in white gill sans serif font beneath a pink triangle on a black background, which has come to signify AIDS activism to an entire community of people confronting the epidemic. ACT UP's silence equals death message reached a huge mainstream audience when repurposed as a vibrant poster by celebrated New York artist Keith Haring in 1989. ACT UP Golden Gate in San Francisco produced eye-catching t-shirts such as this one, Gadali Braverman's colourful combination of two legendary comic strip characters, Dick Tracy and Clark Kent or Superman, locked in a passionate embrace and promoting safe sex condom usage. Here in Australia, local branches of ACT UP in Sydney and Melbourne produce similarly impressive graphics. While in Sydney, the fags, or fucking angry gays, group also regularly plastered the city's streets and laneways with vividly coloured stickers. More than any other issue in living memory in 1994, the AIDS crisis provided the impetus for public art. And I included a wide selection of that here as well. In the US, official attempts to educate the public about the way in which AIDS was not transmitted was subject to censorship. Grand Fury's bus panel poster, Kissing Doesn't Kill, Greed and Indifference Do, 1989, sponsored by the American Foundation for AIDS Research, was banned in Chicago and in Washington, D.C., after a city alderman complained that its interracial and same-sex kissing couples seemed to be directed at children for the purposes of recruitment. Things were not much better here in Australia, where in 1980, the Victorian AIDS Council found itself at the centre of a controversy surrounding a seemingly innocuous poster proclaiming, when you say yes, say yes to safe sex. 
and imaging two young men, fully clothed, kissing. The resulting scandal brought to the fore a still conservative Australian society's deep-seated fear of the same-sex kiss. In 1993, the breezy yet confrontational posters produced jointly by the Victorian AIDS Council and the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisations, which were aimed at promoting safe sex through the establishment of gay pride and self-esteem, were refused publication in this nation's most popular television magazine. This section of the exhibition was bookended by works that address communities on the receiving end of AIDS phobic prejudice, as well as bigots who still openly propagated prejudicial and hate speech at the time. At one end of this gallery, Melbourne artist Ross Moore's six metre long canvas triptych of the visible and hidden 1992 to 93, narrated in allegorical terms, the outpouring of press venom over the death of Hollywood icon Rock Hudson in 1985. Examining how in the process, the gay body became demonised and viralised in the mainstream press as a pathological incubator of moral morbidity. While New York artist Thomas Woodruff's medievalising painted skull panels begged the question of the religious rights argument that AIDS was God's new plague upon the morally corrupt. At the other end of the gallery and at the midpoint of the exhibition, Larry Jens Anderson, an artist based in Atlanta, Georgia, offered audiences his Christian revenge theory, 1989, an over life-size steel crucifix hung with branding irons reading fag, sin, AIDS, HIV, etc. Jens Anderson created his series of Christian revenge theory works after seeing a man wearing a baseball cap imprinted with the words, praise God for AIDS. I included his work as a powerful corrective against the impact of the report published in 1986 by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, head of the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and later Pope Benedict XVI. This was Ratzinger's infamous letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church on the pastoral care of homosexual persons. Here Ratzinger declared homosexuality to be, quote, a tendency ordered towards an intrinsic moral evil and thus the inclination itself must be seen as an objective disorder, end quote. Given this, when nations legalised homosexuality, Ratzinger argued, quote, neither the church nor society at large should be surprised when irrational and violent reactions increase, end quote. Not surprisingly, Ratzinger's report led to an immediate increase in anti-gay violence throughout the world. As Pope Benedict XVI, Ratzinger would later proclaim that protecting humanity from homosexuality was just as important as saving the world from climate change. A poster produced by the AIDS Action Council of the ACT and people living with AIDS ACT closed this section of the exhibition. Mimicking bar mirrors of the past, it consisted simply of an eye-catching gold frame around a large sheet of mirror-reflective metallic paper. Stenciled at the top of the mirror were the words, a typical person with HIV. The contents of the frame were the ever-changing reflections of people passing by as they entered the next, potentially most controversial section of the exhibition, which was devoted to human sexuality. Upon entering this fourth gallery, viewers were met with impressive works by American artists Cindy Sherman and Masami Teraoka, humorously engaged the need for women to empower themselves by insisting that their sexual partners use condoms. Michelle Barker's Let's Fuck 1992 also spoke frankly about the need for women to empower themselves sexually in the age of AIDS. Through recognition of the dangers of unsafe sex and seizure of responsibility for their own sexual health. A similar dialogue about the dangers of unprotected sex, this time within the gay and lesbian communities, was the subject of American photographer Michael Rosen's John and Frank and Joyce and Tatiana, both 1992. John Schlesinger's photographs, mounted on steel saw blades, alerted heterosexual viewers too that their sex lives were potentially on a knife's edge in the age of AIDS. Back in Australia, Indigenous artist Rees Lemons 1-4 1994 caught the eye with crisp computer-generated forms, high-gloss surfaces and dazzling colour. Rees' combination of flower and lemon imagery symbolised the bittersweet nature of sexual contact between women in a time of infection and included a frank instructive text explaining the correct use of dental dams in female oral genital sexual play. Lemon's brilliant colours and high gloss surfaces seduced the viewer into looking. 
and then becoming engaged in a dialogue about what was still a taboo for many at the time, women to women transmission of HIV. In the United States in particular, in the years leading up to the staging of Don't Leave Me This Way, fundamentalist critics had attacked any work about AIDS and human sexuality as pornography or obscenity. This led in 1989 to the controversy surrounding Andre Serrano's Piss Christ photograph, the closure of the Corcoran Gallery's Robert Mapplethorpe exhibition in Washington, DC, and here in Brisbane, the State Library of Queensland shredding of books containing Robert Mapplethorpe photographs of male nudes. I sought to diffuse the Mapplethorpe situation by displaying two photographs that poignantly juxtapose the eternity of life in art with the fugitive nature of the artist's own existence. The label here reminding visitors that Mapplethorpe died of AIDS-related complications in 1989. Serrano I placed at the centre of the show's sexuality room, juxtaposing his morgue photograph of the hands of a woman who had died from AIDS with an arc of sperm and a spurt of blood, remind us that the two fluids of life had become potential vectors of death in an infected world. On an opposite wall, works by the South African and British duo Ridgeway Bennett were actually painted with blood and semen, underscoring that these bodily fluids did not long survive outside the human body, their potency negated by contact with air. Sadly, Jeremy Ridgeway died of age-related complications two weeks before Don't Leave Me This Way opened. Finally, in Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS, I wish to image the most important community of all, that of PLWHAs, or people living with HIV AIDS. I wanted to close the exhibition in particular with a powerful statement about how HIV AIDS, while certainly having devastated some communities more than others by 1994, nonetheless respected no borders and threatened every community. The final room of the exhibition asked viewers to consider that people with HIV AIDS are people first and people with a life-threatening illness second. The majority of photographic portraits of PLWHAs were reserved for this closing section, forcing visitors to gaze time and again directly into the faces of people affected by the disease. I deliberately chose a selection of photographic portraits of HIV positive people of different genders, sexualities, ages and races. This was important at a time when there was still talk of quarantining people with AIDS to protect the general population. Audiences thus viewed Bill Bitsura's portraits of US AIDS activists, Mona Bennett, the office administrator of ACT UP Atlanta, who we see here, and Dean and Floyd, also from ACT UP Atlanta, Floyd allowing us to see the Mediport that had been surgically implanted in his chest so that he could be hooked up to IVs with AIDS medication. Audiences also saw Rosalind Solomon's confronting portraits of a man who had just told his parents of his diagnosis and of another brave soul who chose to publicly lobby for help combating the disease rather than hiding his Kaposi sarcoma cancer lesions from the world. And through Chicago-based Lynn Sloan's beautiful Faces of AIDS portraits, audiences met people who wanted to stand up and be counted. Such as Jerry from the city of Chicago's water department, a man living with AIDS since 1984, whose brother, a priest, died of AIDS in 1989 and HIV-positive Laurie and her children, whose husband and 23-month-old son had both died of AIDS. The very last walls of the exhibition were given over to Australians with HIV AIDS from Cathy Trivett's self-imaging project, which had begun in 1987 as a response to numerous of her friends who had been diagnosed with HIV in the early 80s. I wanted the last impression on the retina of each visitor to be that of a fellow Australian living with the disease with all the emotional loading and self-examination of personal prejudice that came with that. This section was also aimed at the local HIV positive community, enabling them to feel that they were not just being talked about, but were through representative subjects, given an important voice within the exhibition. Teaching people basic photography and then handing the camera over to them, Cathy Trifford empowered HIV positive people to tell their own stories and remind us of their humanity. Autobiographical texts accompanied the final stories told here in Don't Leave Me This Way, such as that of Michelle, who was diagnosed as HIV positive in February 1985 
and who subsequently had child killer spray painted on her front door after she fell pregnant with her second child. She recalled how, when diagnosed, the doctor said it was a gay disease, and I said, well, how come I have it? The final work that people encountered in the exhibition was a conceptual piece by Tony Carden, not a professional artist, but a member of ACT UP Sydney and a volunteer with the AIDS Council of New South Wales. At once simple and humane, Carden's Warrior Blood 1993 was a panorama of drops of blood collected from people Carden believed to have been warrior braves in the relentless war against the scourge of AIDS. Health officials, activists, fundraisers, hospital workers and community support workers were among those whose blood droplets signed and dated invited us to consider the enormous human toll wrought by the AIDS crisis. The majority of blood samples in Carden's work were from HIV negative hosts, such as the Nursing Sisters of Sydney St Vincent's Hospital, a fine tribute to the role that the Sisters of Charity and other religious orders had played in caring for the terminally ill. This was a tribute which needed to be made at the close of the exhibition to balance artworks seen earlier that had attacked the self-righteous fulminations of some religious leaders, in particular the stance taken on both homosexuality and AIDS by Pope John Paul II, who was opposed to anyone using condoms anywhere, in any context, any time. The opening of Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS, which took place for 1,500 guests at the unusually late hours of 9pm to midnight on a warm Saturday evening, was a celebration of diversity and survival. The party atmosphere was superbly leavened by Brenton Heath Carr's final performance work. Brenton stunned the opening crowds by mingling amongst them encased in a full latex bodysuit that imaged the ravages upon the body of a person in the final stages of dying from age-related complications. Brenton himself succumbed to the disease shortly after this brave and moving performance. Instead of an art catalogue, Don't Leave Me This Way was accompanied by a book of critical essays about artistic, social and political responses to HIV AIDS in the Western world. This book enabled the inclusion of works that were too large to be physically accommodated within the exhibition itself, such as William Yang's 17 image photo essay documenting the decline in health and death from age related complications of his friend Alan. A conference for 250 attendees was also held over the exhibition's opening weekend. And my intern during the exhibition, Lucina Ward, who is now Curator of International Art at the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra, curated an extraordinarily comprehensive season of video and film responses to the AIDS crisis, which was screened in the NGA's public theatre throughout the exhibition's run. Following its opening, Don't Leave Me This Way received an average 8,000 visitors per week over its four-month run at the National Gallery of Australia. People being drawn to Canberra from all over the country by the massive media attention the exhibition received. The response to the show was overwhelmingly positive and from a wide variety of communities. One indicator of this positive response was the fact that, despite the presence of much sexually explicit and potentially controversial imagery in the exhibition, the National Gallery received only one letter of complaint, which was penned three weeks before the exhibition opened by an alarmed citizen who had not yet seen the show. During the entire run of the exhibition, the gallery had just a single telephone call complaining about any aspect. This was a caller offended by the presence of the word fuck in one of the works on display. A comments book was placed within the exhibition to enable visitors to record directly their responses. At the conclusion of the show, this had swelled to two volumes containing hundreds of comments on the exhibition and its rationales. Not all of these remarks were positive, it must be said. One angry member of the public felt that the show was very biased towards gay people with AIDS. Another, that there was too much emphasis on gays and gay lifestyle, almost promoting it. More works on disease and less on homosexuality would be preferable. These negative comments were, however, overwhelmingly outnumbered by positive responses, such as this one penned anonymously, an excellent exhibition that highlights the ludicrousness of homophobia and the AIDS phobia that has haunted governments and thus killed people. It was both damning of this and showed the reality of HIV affecting all people's lives, gay, straight, black, white, female, male. 
From these comments books and observation of the visiting crowds, it was evident that the exhibition reached out to people suffering from post-AIDS grief and offered a healing catharsis for many visitors. For the first time, national security staff were face to face with visitors openly weeping within the exhibition, hugging each other or simply quietly touching each other for emotional support. As an indicator that public grieving was okay, tissues and comfortable leather armchairs were placed in a small timeout area at the center of the exhibition where signage also directed visitors to a separate and quiet reading room for further processing of their experiences and emotions. Finally, market research polls of visitors undertaken by the National Gallery of Australia during the run of Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS, reveal that nine out of 10 visitors to the gallery actually visited Don't Leave Me This Way, that seven out of 10 visitors were aged under 40 years, the youngest demographic pattern of visitors to the National Gallery since 1983, and that over eight out of 10 visitors were impressed with the exhibition. The typical kind of response being, the exhibition shows positive representation of people with HIV AIDS versus the negative mainstream media reporting. Or, the exhibition is showing responsibility, health, open-mindedness, and that AIDS can be caught by anyone. My own favorite response to Don't Leave Me This Way, Art in the Age of AIDS, was penned by journalist Marion Frith in the Canberra Times several days after the show's opening. Frith wrote, Two men are standing in front of a photograph of a young man who had died of AIDS and whose father has buried him. A woman in a Maggie Shepherd outfit stands beside them. You're not the artist, are you? She asks. No, one of them answers, wiping a tear from his cheek. I'm just a poofter who's HIV positive. She looks stunned, then reaches out and touches his arm. And I'm just a woman, she says, who until tonight was a bigot. Thank you.